So welcome everyone. My name is David Manser, I'm the Dean of the Faculty uh, at the current time. And I'd like to introduce you to uh, Deanna Rex from Simon Fraser University. He's going to give a uh, talk uh, this afternoon or this morning, what time is it, 11.30, uh, about uh, tuition um, policies across three different jurisdictions. Uh, Deanna Rex is an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Education and an affiliate scholar at the Center for the Study of Educational Leadership and Policy at Simon Fraser University. And this session, by the way, is co-sponsored by the faculty and also the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. And we have a couple of representatives from the Institute at the back of the room, Robert Rennell, and uh, Joan Hansen. So we're glad to have them here. We've got a couple more visitors, that's great. Um, just so that you know, as you probably figured out, we are going to be videotaping today session. Uh, the Manitoba Institute of Public uh, Policy Research has a YouTube channel and all the sessions that they organize and run are then uh, posted on a YouTube channel. So if you've never been to their site, you should take a look at that. Some very interesting sessions that have been recorded in the past. Uh, in this talk, Deanna will present results from her dissertation research, a comparative case study of three episodes of significant tuition policy change in BC, Ontario, and Manitoba. The research builds upon an emerging international field of inquiry, policy, and politics of higher education, and contributes important empirical, descriptive, and conceptual findings to the Canadian literature on post-secondary policy. She'll describe the five conditions associated with major tuition policy change, how the practice of politics is central to tuition policy formation in Canada, and what influence strategies successful policy actors use in these venues. So, uh, once again, welcome, Deanna, to the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. And uh, good morning, and thank you to the Faculty uh, of Education and the Institute uh, for co-hosting this session and for the kind invitation. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to, to the opportunity to share with you what I think are one of the most important issues uh, facing post secondary education, and that is the, the public policy climate uh, and, and the changing climate uh, that shapes and defines our institutions. Uh, I study policy process uh, because to most of us, education policy making is a, a, a mysterious black box, um, a mystifying system that we can really only understand through the outputs um, of that system without much knowledge at all of what happens uh, within uh, that, the internal workings of that watch box. Um, and by policy process, what I mean is the formative stages of policy development and decision making. So in my experience, uh, and I have worked in, in post-secondary education for, for a number of years, the majority of people in post-secondary imagine that education policy making is rational, that it's a, a technical um, and they uh, assume that what's going on in that black box is somehow formulaic or policy analytic. Um, but they know somehow that there's something political going on as well. And that is puzzling and, and frustrating. So the, the puzzle that, that I chose to study is, is tuition policy. Um, there have been significant tuition, tuition policy experiments in Canada over the last 20 years or so. So governments are responding to some sort of perceived problem um, or opportunity. And um, tuition policy is a fairly uh, unique and interesting policy area. Um, first of all, it has a very scant and somewhat um, uh, fragmented li uh, scientific literature. There's not a lot of agreement with the effect of tuition policies. Um, it's a, high, a highly complicated administrative uh, it has a populist nature. Um, people feel uh, some e immediacy to, to tuition policy in a way that not a lot of higher ed policies um, are immediate. And it has very well resourced and organized issue proponents who uh, exist in a long standing political contest. So I find this whole picture quite uh, intriguing. And, and I believe that by improving our understanding of the policy making process, 
Um, we can empower advocates um, with information about how to better affect um, and influence policy, policy formation. So my talk today focuses on, on politics. Um, my research found that the practice of politics was central uh, to tuition policy formation. And this is an important finding because scholars in higher education, not just practitioners, um, have tended to frame policy decisions in terms of system design, uh, reflecting a strategic management uh, notion of, of policy making. Or alternatively, they focus um, usually quite critically on, on policy evaluation. And although these two endeavors are important contributions, neither one contributes important information that would help uh, inform advocates on how to influence Many practitioners are what, what Enders referred to as operating in a blind spot in the policy process. So that's what I'm interested in exploring. So the two questions for today um, I want to help resolve this morning are what exactly are the politics of tuition fees? And secondly, um, how can practitioners, whether that's student leaders, um, and institutional representatives, faculty leaders, uh, politicians, um, how can they successfully influence uh, policy? So what I'd like to do uh, today are, are, are sort of four things. Um, one is to briefly describe my involvement in this research and some of the struggles um, and difficulties I've encountered. And then introduce um, one solution that I, I, I've developed, my research method, um, which is a new analytical framework for st studying the policy process. I'll share some key discoveries and um, talk about um, some of those listed here, successful influence strategies of policy actors, um, how politics uh, operates, and the conditions associated with policy change. And finally, um, hopefully we'll have a good amount of time for the conversation after this. So here is the black box uh, that fascinates me so. Um, the output here being the decision to implement major tuition policy change. So not, we're not looking at incremental change. Um, but significant change of direction. So I have questions about uh, the functions and activities within that black box, but also um, what inputs matter? Um, and to what is the effect of, say, issue framing, agenda setting, and mobilization uh, of issue groups? And so as you can see here, um, some groups have catchier phrases than others. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> For this particular project, I have one primary goal, which is to develop a conceptual model of understanding the process by which provinces develop um, tuition policies and undergo major change. So in order to inform this model, I wanted to empirically identify the key factors in dynamic shaping tuition policy. And that required a close examination um, of episodes which meant gaining access to um, and puzzling through uh, insider information. So studying um, the policy process uh, has its fair share of challenges. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some of those. Starting with uh, sort of the bigger picture, I guess, and working to the more operational. The, in a highly contingent world where you know, history matters and there are very, it's a very busy and complex decision system, and there are, are different, uh, very different views and assertions about what isn't and isn't important, um, where, to, where to start in the policy story uh, can be um, a challenge. And what really helped me to frame my approach was the use of particular theoretical frameworks, um, which provide some helpful delimitations. For example, one um, that I use, we'll talk about in a minute, um, provides a theoretical parameter of 10 years prior to the policy episode. Um, so there's good guidance and very specific guidance about where to start in the historical record and what kind of factors and dynamics to be alert to. In the research context, um, there are a few challenges which are common to other types of social research. Uh, for example, the challenges of elite interviewing, 
which range from gaining access to, to gaining trust um, and, uh, and, and access to government documents. The documents of the cabinet are subject to um, a certain kind of disclosure rules, so they're unavailable. And uh, there are conventions about not reporting what goes on in the cabinet room, um, which limits access to understanding some of the core dialogue that happens around tuitions or policy decisions. Different civil servants um, could be more or less open about sharing government documents, and that certainly also varies from province to province, as well as um, from, from individual to individual. And there are choices to be made about um, um, making requests for documents through access to information um, uh, procedures. So I guess finally, there are also uh, uh, significant challenges, I think, in encountering ongoing <coughs> Policy actors often want to set, set the history straight, set the record straight, um, and uh, also are, are perhaps invested in influencing the future. So uh, much like other fields, uh, again, uh, attention has to be paid to how to um, fairly um, assess and, and represent um, their <coughs> history in a trustworthy way, and that comes down to, uh, to methodology. Some particular uh, challenges I had ranged from how to um, uh, protect uh, source confidentiality. Um, and that ranged from how to edit text uh, to remove the speech patterns to um, struggles with the APA format, which is the education convention that doesn't really um, provide for the kind of referencing that I, I wanted to use. So I had to find ways um, to reconcile um, a number of things, uh, different accounts of history and overcome I think um, an unexpected amount of being purposefully redirected um, and even being set up to tell stories, um, which uh, was an important part of the reflective process uh, of, of writing uh, this work. So let me situate um, my research for you in terms of climate scholarship, um, which draws inspiration from and contributes to a few different uh, literatures. Um, the first uh, specific um, uh, studies of policy and, and politics is a growing area um, of empirical inquiry, um, financing arrangements occupying an important space within that, um, given um, how it um, reflects government priorities and the role of finance in, in post-secondary systems. Um, it's a predominantly American um, body of knowledge and uh, explores various variations and relationships and circumstances and policy outcomes around, around policy formation. Um, often it draws on conceptual frameworks from political science and economics, which suggests a very empiricist American uh, approach. The, the second literature, Education Policy Studies, um, is largely Canadian body of knowledge and just as descriptive, uh, focusing on policy histories, um, often critical uh, in nature, um, many focus on evaluation and draw upon sociology and historical approaches and uh, intersect somewhat with, with work around educational leadership. And finally, um, the provincial politics and Canadian public administration literature, um, which is thinki thinking about uh, government decision making and policy implementation uh, and posing questions of the role of the civil service, um, executive decision making, So as the study of higher education is uh, a field and not a discipline, we borrow uh, from uh, many, many interdisciplinary traditions, as I'm sure uh, many of you do too, um, sociology, economics, and, and in my case, in the case of this work, uh, from political science. So let me uh, declare myself in terms of how I uh, approach uh, my work. Um, a political economy approach allows me to consider the particular mixture of government and market forces that I think are uh, appropriate um, in, in higher education today. Um, my research stance generally, um, and this study in particular, is agnostic about tuition policy. I'm not seeking sort of normative answers um, about policy choices, um, rather focusing on, on the process itself. In this particular study, I employ uh, 
two conceptual frameworks um, uh, from studies of policy process, kingdoms, multiple streams, which has been widely uh, used to answer the question in the primordial soup of ideas, why does policy change occur? And uh, um, he posits that uh, a policy window opens as a result of the convergence of three different streams. Um, the the problem stream where problem recognition and sitting occurs, uh, the policy stream which involves identification and formulation of alternatives uh, and options and, and, and politics. In the advocacy coalition framework, which is sort of less known, less used, but, but growing, um, is a, explains policy change as a result of shocks to a policy community or a policy subsystem. And these shocks could be uh, within the policy community or from without. Um, within, um, these could be changes in beliefs or values uh, as, a, as a result of um, changes in, in the membership of the, of the community or as a result of policy learning. Um, and in changes in the external environment, uh, such as uh, changes in socioeconomic conditions, uh, changes in government, um, and, and changes in public opinion can, can act as shocks. So these two frameworks provide alternative and complementary lenses on, on the study of policy process. Uh, together uh, can generate new insights um, and, and complementary insights into uh, and provide the basis for an interesting um, and theoretically informed approach to unpacking uh, this particular puzzle. So I've, I've, I've sent around a handout. Um, and on the front page, um, is the operationalized analytical framework, uh, which is how I deploy these two conceptual frameworks um, based on research from uh, an American, Eric Ness. Uh, it has five key dimensions, as you see, um, goals and their clarity, uh, the influence of elected and unelected actors, um, policy co uh, coalitions, their behavior, uh, and, their ability, and their stability over time, political activity, and the effects of external influences, such as changes in public opinion on related issues, change in government, um, or change in financial conditions. So the handout shows uh, uh, this in greater detail. I'm not going to um, spend any more time on this. But each each um, um, dimension has between four and eight key questions that uh, guided my field work and provided direction, direction to the case and my comparative So in order to best answer uh, key process questions and to develop this conceptual understanding of policy change, um, I used a comparative approach uh, to the qualitative design response to the need for situationally rich, thick descriptions, which are needed to provide new insights um, in an area uh, not, not well explored. Um, the multiple case method is, uh, has been demonstrated to, to be helpful in supporting testing and building of these kinds of frameworks, particularly in studies that focus on process. Um, so to, to develop these case, three cases, of which Manitoba is one, um, I draw, draw upon uh, 10 years of, of documentary evidence uh, prior to the policy change and data from 59 interviews uh, that I conducted with senior civil servants, politicians, um, leaders of organized interests, lobby, aid lobbyists, institutional representatives, researchers, commentators, um, and the interviewees were purposefully selected uh, based on um, the archival research and, and expert advice and, and then I used um, snowball sampling. Uh, I transcribed the interviews um, and, and uh, used them and, and the archival documents to generate uh, a few analytical elements for each case. Um, so this included the background context of the case um, including an inventory of the major interest groups and, and their characteristics and, and um, policy goals, uh, the antecedent policy conditions, and then a, a chronological account of, of what happened in this uh, episode of policy change. So the, ch the cases I chose to investigate are here in chronological order. Um, I used several uh, selection criteria, uh, which I'm happy to talk about later if you're interested. Uh, British Columbia uh, shifted from a policy of tuition reduction to 
deregulated tuition. Um, and after seven, several years of regulated increases, Ontario moved to freeze tuition. And Manitoba, as you probably well know, after many years of frozen tuition, um, moved to a policy of restricted increases. Uh, increases. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, each of the individual cases, and then we'll move on to the lessons we can draw from them. So British Columbia had an, um, it's a me medium-sized uh, post-secondary system, and, and the politics in BC is famously polarized. Mm -hmm. And during the 1990s, um, a tuition freeze was held in place uh, for six years by an NDP government, um, while at the same time failing to fund mandated uh, uh, system increases. Uh, institutions during that period began to lobby government uh, quite actively on the negative effects, or, or what we could term the hidden costs, uh, hidden costs of the tuition freeze and its effect on quality. Uh, there were emerging stories in the media uh, and, and in government about problems of access. So for example, there were stories about ridiculously high academic requirements to get into UBC. And those stories were particularly um, well told. Uh, problems with uh, students accessing third and fourth year courses because of problems with uh, uh, capacity and upper level courses, and problems around physical space. Uh, and during this time, there were significant uh, shifts in policy actors. Um, the, the University President's Council, which is the coalition that represents research universities in British Columbia, uh, shifted dramatically toward a much uh, stronger, more sophisticated program of government lobbying, and there were new presidents uh, who were uh, very influential who arrived in the province. Uh, the colleges and institutes had a long-standing uh, organization, um, uh, advocacy organization, which completely fell apart um, due to uh, a wedge issue within that coalition. And, uh, and so the voice of colleges and institutes was quite fragmented. And within the student movement, um, there was also uh, fragmentation and some serious distractions. So by 2001, uh, the general election uh, saw an overwhelming majority of UBC liberals. In fact, there were only two NDP uh, um, members left in the House. Um, the BC Liberal Party uh, was very focused on economic development and saw the post-secondary system as um, a solution, or one of the solutions to their overall economic agenda. So they implemented substantial, substantive change um, immediately after the election. It's surprising, surprisingly rapidly, um, including an overall fiscal review of government finance, um, a core review of all government programs and services, um, which resulted in a significant reduction of the civil service on a day called Black Thursday, um, closure of education agencies, and even some post-secondary institutions. So the new minister uh, set up highly managed consultations uh, with uh, stakeholders on tuition policy. Um, there was strong advocacy within government uh, to allow institutions to increase their fees to resolve some of these very public quality problems. Um, tuition policy change um, was seen by uh, uh, government as a necessary evil to accomplish both their policy and political goals. And in context, the tuition policy change was a relatively small decision in a sweeping program of cuts and reorganization to government. Now, Ontario, um, a very large uh, post-secondary system, and at the time uh, had sort of a similar array of organized interests to what I've described in BC. It was a council of universities, it was the advocacy coalition for universities, and the Association of Colleges of Applied Arts and Technology of Ontario, um, which represented um, the other institutions. Uh, where Ontario differs uh, from the other two provinces in this, in this study is the degree to which the student movement is um, uh, seriously fractured. Uh, there are two major student associations um, who represent university students who have what might be generously described as an acrimonious relationship um, and a separate college student association um, competing for membership and resources as well as political space. So Ontario uh, had a lengthy history of tuition increases um, and, and 
forms of deregulation in the 1990s under successive governments. And by the early 2000s, uh, changing enrollment and um, uh, significant cuts to government grants have created um, significant pressure on tuition and resulted, and resulted in demands of government to fix the overall financial model um, of higher education, um, one uh, aspect of which, tuition. Among members of the policy community, there was a sense that tuition, um, that some institutions had taken uh, liberties, they had been too aggressive and too opportunistic uh, with tuition freedom and had pushed prices too far, um, and certainly well uh, beyond the tolerance of public opinion. And polls showed that people felt tuition uh, fees had become too high. And the two student associations, uh, uh, university student uh, associations, uh, who rarely agreed on anything, both agreed that a tuition freeze was vital. So as the official opposition uh, at that time, uh, the Liberal Party actively sought alliances um, and brokered a coalition heading into the general election which met the policy agenda of the two university student associations. They promised a freeze um, and it, uh, for two years. Um, and while this coalition was a bit bumpy uh, and it didn't last, ultimately, um, the liberals were elected and a tuition fee, uh, freeze was put in place. Um, the, the other piece of the story, which is important, is to, to gain support, or at least to avoid conflict from uh, or with the, the universities, uh, the uh, Liberal Party promised um, to fund the offsets, the cost of the tuition freeze uh, directly, and they promised a formal review, um, which institutions saw as an exit strategy from the tuition freeze. Um, and ultimately, that later um, came to be the, the Ray Review. So in Manitoba, um, Going back to 1999, uh, the, tu the tuition freeze was one of the NDP's hallmark policies uh, in the general election. And many senior members of the party believed that it was both a successful policy in promoting and signaling access and uh, an important electoral strategy. Um, there was a sense that the tuition freeze had become part of the government brand, and uh, how it was described to me was that it had become a political article of faith. So, during the 2000s, uh, when financial conditions and institutions became increasingly strained, um, institutions, the civil service, uh, local business interests, interestingly enough in Manitoba, and, and the media became increasingly um, describing threats to educational quality. Um, there were reported issues of sort of similar um, uh, conditions as in British Columbia, uh, overcrowded classrooms, infrastructure difficulty, and difficulty Students became increasingly divided on the issue of tuition, uh, the tuition freeze, and some uh, students uh, felt that the tuition freeze was uh, having a negative impact on their quality of education. Um, here at the University of Manitoba in the Faculty of Engineering, uh, there was a crisis, um, uh, which uh, was, was quite public, uh, which focused blame on the tuition freeze policy. Um, there was a perceived threat uh, to the ability of the university to provide accredited engineers for the process, or uh, for the province. And um, that, that accreditation crisis, crisis both signaled and facilitated the change in mood around, around the tuition policy. There were two um, separate, there were also two separate um, shifts in the policy community that I think are important. Um, the first was that the Manitoba um, organization of uh, faculty associations softened their position on tuition policy, um, a, a, a position that had been formerly quite strong. Um, and second and more importantly, uh, I think organized labor publicly um, distanced themselves from the tuition freeze um, and, um, and the student organizations, rupturing what would have been up to that point seemingly a very solid coalition. So in the general election in 2007, um, the NDP uh, uh, carefully controlled their commitments um, with the overall intention of avoiding uh, a commitment uh, in their platform to, a, to the freeze. Uh, during the development of the first budget after the election, um, 
the universities had signaled that uh, there were significant uh, deficits and, and, and demanded increased funding. Um, and by that time, the economic recession had started to influence government planning. Uh, a story uh, in the Winnipeg Free Press the day before the budget speech, the plan budget speech, uh, suggested an end to the freeze and, and, and caught many off guard. Um, it ended up mobilizing the student unions and the young know, New Democrats to intervene, and there was a, a bit of a public tussle about whether or not uh, the NDP had actually made a, com a campaign promise. Um, and the government backed away and announced a one-person commission to review accessibility and affordability and excellence, um, which became um, uh, the commission that, that um, uh, one person commission wrote the report. So at the center of that tuition free debate, sort of politics aside, um, was the question about is its effectiveness as social policy. Right? Um, was this really promoting or signaling accessibility? And the commission was the venue chosen to help settle this question by looking at available evidence. Um, and uh, in the end, the commission did recommend moderate increases and uh, the government uh, adopted some of the So, turning from uh, my findings in these cases, um, I'm going to start uh, my remarks on influence strategies. And there are three primary findings uh, shown here, and I'm, I'll, I'm going to direct my comments primarily to the first. Policy actors each have their own preferences. Um, in, in these cases, insider tactics and direct strategies were more likely to be successful um, to in, in influencing policy, which is consistent with, with other research. And what I mean by this is the efforts of a relatively small number of people um, uh, to place a policy issue on a government agenda are made um, with little or no attention uh, from the public. Uh, and uh, those efforts are directed to politicians and civil servants uh, as opposed to working to influence public uh, mobilization of political supporters. So even in the case of Ontario, um, the, the tuition freeze, the policy goal was sought by uh, the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario who support generally um, outside tactics uh, and indirect strategies. That policy decision was predominantly achieved by insider tactics. Uh, there are no drawbacks um, to this type of influence strategy. Uh, the literature suggests that policy change will be incremental in nature, a uh, term bargainable incrementalism. And indeed, uh, while I didn't focus on this uh, specifically <coughs> as part of my study, I offer that this was the view of the policy actors I interviewed in this study. So student in organizations take advantage of all opportunities uh, afforded through both direct and indirect strategies. Um, the CFS generally supported more outsider tactics in CASA or in um, organizations. Um, and given the limited number of cases um, in this study, um, I would offer a qualified observation that the conditions of student success appear to be increased uh, when, there, um, when brokerage politics is occurring in, the, in a tight electoral contest. Um, and we'll come more to the electoral calculation in a minute. And finally, um, there are softening, softening up processes are evident in all cases, uh, which is important. So as I said, um, the study shows the centrality of, of politics and political practices to tuition policy making. In fact, there's very little evidence at all of technical policy making in these cases. Um, and by technical, what I mean is what I described at the beginning of my talk about how practitioners want the policy making good policy analytic exercises. Um, so as a, as a sidebar, the use of research by decision makers, uh, um, this would be interesting, I think, to researchers mm -hmm. um, who are committed to mobilizing uh, research um, and, and uh, belief in the importance of science and public policy. Um, the, the use of research and decision makers in these cases might best be described as evidence when necessary, but not necessarily evidence. 
Um, this is consistent with other utilization research, um, which has shown that policymakers tend to not use instruments, uh, research instrumentally, but rather it may inform conceptual or political functions of sort of um, uh, uses. For policymakers, um, tuition serves important political functions far beyond espoused education and social goals. And uh, it's a useful reminder that, that public education is a profound political institution and an interesting uh, intersection of interests and ideas. So let's explore uh, some of these functions, uh, starting with elections. So scholars have noted that uh, um, there's a, a connection uh, policymaking in the electoral cycle. And certainly in this study, proximity to the general election is a notable factor. Um, the policy change um, happened uh, early in each government's mandate and um, uh, was only a campaign promise in one of them, Ontario. Uh, interviewees in, in all three cases reported a same conventional wisdom, and that is significant change needs to be implemented early in government. So in this study, um, in BC and Manitoba, there was no direct relationship between campaign and policy outcome. Um, however, these results um, could really understate the degree to which tuition policy becomes embedded in policy in party platforms. Um, in both BC and in Manitoba, looking back into policy history, um, there have been times when, uh, significant times, the establishment of both of the tuition freeze, long-standing tuition freezes, um, where those uh, those arose from previous governments making campaign promises um, and then uh, and maintaining maintaining them. So examination of further cases um, may sort of flesh out some of the, the some of what that relationship is all about. So on to voting, um, and I thought I would share. Um, some voices from my interviews with cabinet ministers um, in each of these cases about voting. Um, maybe you can help me understand. So the elected officials um, I interviewed, who one might imagine uh, had some good insights into electoral politics, expressed many contradictory or qualified views, um, and sometimes even in the same breath. So you see here, um, I don't think it can be strongly documented, except in smaller communities, but polling doesn't show that it doesn't really matter. Um, and a common view of these elected officials was that the electoral politics uh, around tuition was definitely not straightforward. They expressed some skepticism about the direct electoral importance of the policy, and yet found it to be a requirement. So here, another uh, minister says that tuition policy is both a powerful tool in electoral politics and yet probably not critical to electoral success. Uh, and suggesting here, I think of a sort of provocative um, idea that uh, it's difficult to achieve a balance between um, policy and policy. Finally, this cabinet minister describes how policy is not top of mind to vote for voters, and yet it won't go away. So cabinet ministers in all three provinces reported that this was not pivotal, um, that it was, but it was important to the overall policy agenda, that it was not an electoral issue in these particular episodes, but that um, it could be in some particular constituencies, and that overall there's a, a, a balance between addressing local politics and provincial level concerns. So these different uh, representations uh, can be explained, I think, by looking beyond a simple electoral connection to other political functions of tuition policy, and in particular, the impact on brokerage success and successful coalition building. And I'm going to start um, by suggesting that there's two roles that tuition policy plays in party politics. Uh, one, uh, the partisan role, which stems from ideology and opportunistic 
and arguably all parties um, uh, show or suffer from, I'm not sure what it is, opportunistic tendencies uh, for electoral success. So tuition evokes ideological symbolism that can serve an important partisan function in the glue or maintenance of political coalitions. Uh, and as the advocacy coalition framework would suggest, in the case of partisan policy development, idea, ideas about tuition policy emerge from uh, profound cultural commitments and uh, shared values. Now, this study does raise question about uh, the limits of brokerage politics and the practice of coalition, uh, coalition building based on post-secondary policy alone. Um, we saw, uh, I saw patterns of brokerage politics and policy in histories in all three provinces. Um, uh, and the most, the most obvious episode was in Ontario, um, but that uh, that coalition was definitely uh, much more fragile, as we saw, uh, because it, it, it failed to last. Tuition supports an important, uh, a powerful political narrative, um, and it's sufficiently powerful to be attractive uh, to part political parties seeking to differentiate themselves. And uh, as, as others, too, have found I argue that the key to understanding the dynamics of tuition policy change is acknowledging, um, or policy formation more generally, is acknowledging this value in a broader political struggle. Um, the heightened visibility and symbolic importance of higher education makes it an attractive, an attractive topic and a venue for political actors and interest groups to engage. And so we can talk about this uh, symbolic importance uh, later if, if you're interested. So there are, there are many instances in the study of uh, uh, policy actors talking about the importance of uh, political differentiation. <coughs> and so um, we go back to Catherine <coughs> A, who uh, spoke with uh, such eloquence about differentiation. Um, it's sometimes as simple as looking for the argument that represents a clear distinction between much less about the search for the right public policy answer. Uh, particular, particularly evocative, I thought, uh, is this is one of the lesser examined logics in education policy making. So one last point um, on the, the different functions of politics. I feel I have to speak about protest I just finished all of my field work and I was in the early stages of uh, data analysis when the Maple Spring erupted in 2012 and at the time coming <coughs> up, just by a few months, I might be here talking about the PEC. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar here, the uh, red square was a symbol of which I was protest against the decisions to increase tuition fees there. So one might imagine, and certainly I imagine, coming into this work that the politics of protest would have an impact on retail politics <coughs> and tuition policy episodes. Um, as some research has indicated, the, the positive effect um, from student resistance. And certainly, student organizations often claim credit for uh, policy outcomes, uh, favorable policy outcomes. Sometimes they compete to claim credit for policy outcomes. In this study, while there were mobilizations uh, <coughs> of public protest in both BC and in Manitoba, uh, where the tuition freezes were, were thawed, the protest dynamic seems to function really much more as a backdrop. Um, it appears that it is an element to um, uh, sort of leverage of interest group uh, bargaining and political power uh, in facilitating brokered uh, agreements, uh, such as in Ontario, uh, politicians really didn't want spectacles. Um, uh, however, um, as we see again in Ontario, that had a very short-term effect on life. So I'm very, I'm intrigued by this topic, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts about about this. So this is a a busy slide, and I'm um, so if you're thinking about uh, both influence strategies and the various uh, ways in which tuition appears to be um, a 
attracted to, to political activity, you know, kind of go forward to, to talk about the, the factors and policy change. So this is a summary of factors that I found influencing policy change in these cases. And uh, the ones in bold were also those not only most uh, uh, com common across these cases, but were predicted or anticipated by the conceptual frameworks. So on the column to the right uh, are some of those factors which might have conceivably uh, had an impact um, on, on these episodes, but after analysis, weren't found in the study. So regardless of policy choices um, and context, governments describe their overall policy goals as the provision of quality and accessible education. Um, the word accessibility uh, carries very different connotations in, this, in each case, um, but that is how they, they frame um, uh, and, uh, their agenda. They made short-term policy decisions. Um, these were not, these were not long-term policy decisions. Short-term policy decisions uh, to address immediate problems and meet the needs of their uh, 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 interests of their stakeholders. So governments in all cases were responding to perceived negative impacts or the unintended consequences of previous policy decisions, and that might provide some clue as to the differentiation activity that goes on. The, influential, the most influential policy actors were uh, premiers and the senior members of cabinet who set the overall decision agenda for the government. Um, premiers in each, cases, uh, each case reportedly had a particular interest in this policy and um, the desired resolution, uh, and desired resolution uh, particularly of issues in universities. Sadly, co the issues of colleges really don't factor much into these um, calculations. Uh, the premiers in each of these cases were seasoned politicians with well-organized and well-resourced parties uh, at the time of the policy change. So I bring these factors that are in bold forward uh, into the proposed conceptual model, which is uh, in the handout, uh, which proposes a set of conditions for policy change. Uh, each of the alternative theories uh, of policy change con contributing and highlighting different aspects of policy contingency. Uh, these conditions re reflect common change factors. <coughs> First, within the broader uh, environment, the model uh, identifies a changing public mood on post-secondary education. And that really does come to access. This change both contributes to uh, and responds to uh, framing and agenda setting uh, by individuals, groups, and media change in the public mood is a key element in both conceptual frameworks. And so when we think about the politics of representation and uh, um, electoral interests and these things, this change in public opinion um, is part of the equation. Second, the model identifies changing uh, political and policy alliances uh, within the post-secondary community. And these changes can be uh, new or different uh, interest mobilization or changes in the cohesion within coalitions um, or political activity between coalitions. And this type of activity uh, in the advocacy coalition framework is an important uh, uh, internal shock. And finally, the policy or the model anticipates emerging of three streams uh, with specific factors, um, changing financial conditions um, in the problem stream uh, which could be identified through systemic indicators or, or a focusing event um, in the policy stream, uh, changing concerns about accessibility, and within uh, the policy window, uh, or the, finally the policy window would appear to occur when there's a change in mandate for government um, and a strong premier. So I'm very excited to add new cases uh, to explore commonalities and differences in policy dynamics um, in in more provinces and over different time periods uh, to further develop uh, this model with the goal of identifying both necessary and sufficient conditions for, for policy change. So that there are some specific implications for practice. Um, first, uh, to maximize opportunity for uh, uh, policy actors benefit from actively maintaining a strong and effective this activity involves playing cl 
close attention to uh, shared values and policy beliefs and resource distribution uh, across uh, and between co coalition partners over long periods of time. There were two cases where there were uh, short uh, special purpose coalitions who had no effect on, on policy uh, development. These have to be long periods of time. So second, uh, when brokerage arrangements um, or informal coalitions are formed based on policy preferences alone, uh, policy actors need to fully understand the limitations of those commitments. Um, third is in found with other cases uh, of study, studies of the policy process in the US, uh, this research suggests that policy actors benefit from participation in all three streams uh, of activity, uh, contrib contributing to uh, the framing of problems uh, developing policy options and monitoring political changes with the goal of readiness for quick response to a sudden change in conditions. That is a sudden uh, opening of the policy window. And I think this is a particularly important policy knowledge in this area, um, that the winning conditions for advancement of policy ideas are dependent less on rational policy analysis and more on being able to identify those opportunities to advance policy ideas at the, at the critical moment of the right message. And finally, uh, given the relative scarcity of technical information on tuition policy in Canada, uh, there's an anticipated advantage for policy actors to invest in that, uh, or for policy actors to invest in, in policy analytic research that communicates um, clear policy narratives and proposed solutions. So how you can join me in this area, um, there's lots of there's lots of areas that are fruitful for further inquiry. Um, beyond uh, looking at and testing uh, the model that I've developed qualitatively or quantitatively, the whole area of policy learning uh, it is wide open, and the relationship between the producers of ideas, um, the modes, uh, and pathways of dissemination of those ideas. Um, it's fascinating. We really need to, do need to know more about those dynamics and how they affect um, decision making. Uh, more work needs to be done to explore and theorize the nature of these political contests. Um, in terms of values and beliefs in particular, I think understanding the key factors that function in ideational um, and enduring policy disputes in post-secondary education. Uh, and, you know, tuition policy is a good example of a problem area that connects policy actors uh, uh, within this policy community with social movements and institutional actors, and there's some important work to be done there. So I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, I'm really looking forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, that was a very interesting and comprehensive presentation, and uh, why don't we open it up now for questions. Uh,